Now this one is a special dedicator to the bicycle man. Welcome to Bike Life Radio from the studios of KWNK 97.7 FM in Reno, Nevada. I'm Kai Plaskon of BikeWashoe.org. Right on. We have a special announcement for you. This is show number 12, and that means that Bike Life Radio is celebrating a year on air. 12 hours. Somehow that just doesn't seem like enough. I don't know why. Uh, anyway, uh, yay! Imagine fireworks in your head or, or something. Uh, to celebrate today, we're going international, and we're going to do something that we've never done before. We're going to do an interview while riding a bike. Uh, um, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about why American bike infrastructure sucks. We went to the safest place in Reno to, to talk about it and to, to ride our bikes while doing this interview at the same time. Uh, and then we're going to talk to some locals who are moving overseas for better bike networks, among other things. And after that, we're going to hear from my parents who rode around the world and wrote a book about it. And then how about a free place to stay wherever you are in the world on your bike? Warmshowers.org has got you covered, and we've got an interview with them. Before we get to that, bike news. In the Middle East, police are warning, don't take your explosive natural gas cylinders on your e-scooter. Uh, the Dubai police chief said that. Anyway, it's part of a public education campaign to try and get people to follow rules and use paths instead of roads. The problem is, is that roads are the most direct route to places, and so people want to use them. Also in the United Arab Emirates, a military colonel with stars on his shoulders and everything is ordering people on e-scooters to follow rules and get permits for their e-scooters. Riders are supposed to take a 30-minute test to get a permit, and when you get a permit, you get a sticker to put on your scooter. There's just one problem though, people with driver's licenses don't need to get a sticker or a permit, uh, so they don't know who has a permit and who doesn't. Recently, the world was gripped by an image of a little Ukrainian girl having her foot bandaged by a doctor. Social media exploded with speculation on how she had been hit by a Russian missile. Uh, fact checkers jumped on the case and they found that she was injured in a bike accident, not hit in the foot by a Russian missile. In Nigeria, a 12-year-old girl was burned by her employer as punishment for riding a bike. The man has been arrested. He told police that the devil made him do it. The girl did not indicate that God made her ride the bike, but we all know that God wants people to ride bikes and the devil doesn't. Cyclists love stupid new bike inventions. Now there's a new stupid one, the split wheel. Engineer Sergei uh, Gordiev made an extra long bike frame to fit two rear half wheels. One half wheel is right in front of the other half wheel, and they're kind of like upside down from each other, and somehow the thing rolls. The Dutch cycling embassy is headed to Western America in the months of August and September to help our country solve an epidemic of deadly roads. Uh, there is a proposal to bring the cycling embassy to Reno, Nevada. And it's not cheap, though. Uh, donations are being accepted at bikewasho.org. This is Bike Life Radio from KWNK, licensed to the Reno Bike Project in Reno, Nevada. Turning to national bike news, People for Bikes has ranked 1,058 cities for bikeability across the United States. The top three, Provincetown, Massachusetts, Davis, California, and Fayette, Missouri. The 2022 report highlights that the vast majority of American cities have yet to implement relatively simple changes to make communities more bikeable. More info is available on this report uh, at peopleforbikes.org. Want to know why people don't use bike lanes more in America? Well, here's an example. A 71-year-old man in Fremont, California was walking his bike in the bike lane when an SUV killed him. That discourages people from riding their bikes in bike lanes. Speaking of drivers, apparently one parking spot for bikes is one too many for drivers in the Bronx. A guy was parking and fixing bikes for kids in this parking spot, and a woman complained in the Bronx. It's not fair to drivers, she said. 
When people are looking for parking spots for their cars and they see bikes in a parking spot, they curse. So what did police do? Well, they shut down the one bike parking spot. Bike parking might become more important with big business involved. California electric truck company Rivian has filed patents to expand its brand to electric bikes. A former specialized bicycle components executive has joined the company Rivian. The League of American Bicyclists has awarded Bicycle Friendly America workshops to cities around the country. 18 cities were eligible and only five were selected. Among the winners, Reno, Nevada. As part of the two-day workshop with experts, they will do a ride audit. The workshop is sponsored by General Motors. Some are asking why a car company is sponsoring bike events. Uh, now, I'm speculating here, but it's probably to show that General Motors does care about the lives of bicyclists, too. And that's a good thing. So, thanks. That's it for Bike News. You are listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK at bikewashoe.org. Who are right bicycle, no fat man, the slim man, and manga man. Have you ever traveled to another place and thought, boy, uh, it would be really nice to live here? Well, that happened to Yana and her husband, Tom. They went to the Netherlands, they rode their bikes, and they decided, wow, it's so nice here on our bikes. We're going to move out of Reno where it's not so safe for bikes, and we're going to move to the Netherlands where it's really safe for bikes. Uh, Okay, all right, to be fair, that's not exactly what happened, but it is part of the reason. Uh, And so first, we talk to Yana. Here's her own words. I'm from the Netherlands. Really? When did you come here? In 1993. And why would you come here? My parents moved here, and uh, I met this guy, Tom Miller, oh, my Tom. husband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And so you came in 1993 to the United States, right? Correct. All right. And so what was the first thing that you noticed when you came to the United States? Everything was big. Really? Yes. Huh. Your milk jugs are huge. Uh, your cars are huge. Your roads are huge. <laughs> your, sh- your grocery store, like, you can get lost in there. Yeah, everything's big. Uh, everything in Europe is very compact, yes, and small because you do things more on a daily basis, not like this giant shopping spree once a week. Uh-huh. Because everything's built in the in the community, so your grocery store is only like three minute walk, and it's very safe to walk or a bike ride because there's bike infrastructure. So everybody just on their way home from work or or you know kids coming home from school, they pick up you know, the groceries. Yeah. So in terms of uh, bike riding, what did you notice when you came to the United States first? Oh, there's no separate infrastructure for bikes. So in the Netherlands, you have separate, you know, traffic lights and yeah, it's all separated from the cars. So here you had to really be aware where the cars were and hopefully they knew where you were (laughs) and didn't come too close where cars are. So were were you like, this is insane? Yeah. No, not really insane. Tom's Tom's (laughs) nodding his head. He's like, this is insane. But you don't think so. No, no. Well, I mean, not insane, no. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, And so uh, did you think that it could be better or what did you you think? Oh, of course. Yes, yes, yes. I would call it more. It was unfortunate that, you know, that society here is built for the car as opposed to for multimodal. Yeah, Yeah, Mm -hmm. and you said that everything's really big, and I like to tell people that that's kind of an opportunity, that, you know, we have a really big, wide road, and uh, and it can fit stuff like bikes easily. Do you think, like, do you agree with me? Well, yeah. Um, Not, you know, (laughs) not all streets, but Uh yeah, a lot of Uh them, yeah. 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 Uh, Like, right here, we're at Booth, and that could definitely be uh, shortened. Uh, yeah, that's that's, that's Foster mm-hmm. Drive, Foster. and we yeah. actually we came out here yesterday and we measured it, and it's 65 feet across. Oh my wow. goodness! Right. Yeah. So and and that number doesn't really mean a whole lot to people, um, unless you put it in perspective, which is you can fit bike lanes on both sides, you can put a buffer in of three feet on both sides and still have enough room for both travel lanes and the turn lane. So you don't lose anything on that street and you have everything to gain in terms of safety for students because it's at Reno High School. Right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and so that's a really good example of, uh, you know, how we have a super wide street and nobody was really thinking to put a bike lane on there, but you could easily fit one. 
Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a good example. There's quite some streets like that in Reno. Well, I didn't get my driver's license until I was 21 because in Europe, often you don't get your driver's license until later because why would you need it? Because you can get around with a bike so easily and then get to the station. Station takes you you know, anywhere in the Netherlands. Yeah. Did you ever find that there were people there who were like, I want to go somewhere where I have to drive everywhere? You know, they're like, I want to go to America where I have to do that. No. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. There are people who are like, the train is inconvenient. I'm going to drive there because some places are more inconvenient going with the train. Um, but um, but not, no, no. Let's go <laughs> move to Reno because they have wide, 65 foot wide streets now. Nobody said that ever to me. <laughs> huh, interesting. No. No. All right. Do you have any yeah. questions for your wife, Tom? Oh, I have lots of questions. Like um, what? <laughs> you should ask me all the questions already. <laughs> no, I mean some of the some of the reasons for us deciding to move to the Netherlands is, you know, it's it's not just the bike infrastructure which is fantastic. We did a 250 mile bike ride, and 90 percent of it was on separated bike lanes, mm -hmm. and it was fantastic. And that that's kind of what sold me. But it, you know, it's also more than that. You know, it's the the philosophy of the the way people live over there is just more simple and less about the stuff that you have and more about spending time with your neighbors and enjoying each other mm -hmm. so. and, and clubs and getting together and not so much how many square foot does your house have or what car do you drive wait so you're <laughs> gonna go clubbing <laughs> yeah. horse riding uh -huh. club and the and, ah. and the, the rowing club the and the glider club. Yeah. club yeah <laughs> all right not the dance club yeah. probably yeah no no, mm -mm. Oh, no. Okay. they'd probably yeah. kick me out of the country uh, <laughs> if you were, if they caught you dancing <laughs> yeah. yeah um not that bad Maybe, okay, so there's no dance clubs in Europe, though. Of course. <laughs> That's a reason to we come to America. We everything that they have oh, they here, have except for not wide roads yeah. and, and, yeah. So. You could ride your bike to the dance clubs. Yeah, yeah everybody does. Yeah. There's parking garages for bikes. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. <laughs> like multi-story ones. Yes. Right? Yeah. 10,000 yeah. bikes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Did you put your bikes in one when you were there? Yes. We were yeah. in Utrecht, uh, which is in the center of the Netherlands. And we parked a car in the, no, in, uh, sorry, we parked our bikes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what am I saying? In the, in the parking yeah, garage. You might end up going home and being like, let's get on our car and go. And everybody's like, what? You, didn't, I don't, you don't even have a car. And like, <laughs> That's right. Like I mean, a uh, bike. Stuck in America <laughs> mentally. <laughs> and so took the train. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, train, train to Amsterdam. And then when we came back, we had to find our bike back in the uh, 10,000 bike you know, sea of bikes, but uh, yeah, it's just like a parking garage where there's numbers and rows and things like that. So you find your bike again and off you go. Uh -huh. yep. Fantastic. So yeah. you're going to have some, some mental adjustment to do when you get back there. For I sure. Guess, right? yeah. For sure. Yeah. Do you think you'll have any post-traumatic stress from being here in America and like, and oh. this terrible transportation environment we have? Right. I will get back to you on that. Like, like, <laughs> like afraid that somebody's going to hit you in a car, like randomly, like you're walking down the street and just, you know, have this fear. It will be different. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But no, when we did the 250 mile biking, I never felt no. scared that a car would hit us. Oh, good. All mm -hmm. right. Well, that's good. No. So the trauma has no. not been too, too much. No. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I grew up uh, 50 miles east of San Diego where there were no, uh, uh, shoulders so you had to ride 50 miles to I had to ride 50 miles to get home with no shoulders on a really windy road mm -hmm. and so uh, I don't know if I would ever get over that like I have some post-traumatic stress right. from, and if I tried to move to the Netherlands I might be like ah looking around you know right. all the time for mm -hmm. cars mm -hmm. and that, that don't exist no because it's separated yeah it's definitely separated yeah it does and take a while to get used to it though when yeah. you get over there and and you're used to having your head on a swivel to make sure you don't get killed and now you're on a protected bike lane and you're like oh i'm safe here you actually yeah. you Maybe. have to swivel your head because there's so many bikes to make sure that yeah. you know you don't run into <laughs> another bike <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> so you still have to pay attention but a different yeah. maybe there could be a support group for former americans <laughs> that have this, uh, this, sure. this trauma 
I uh, think you should start one. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. no, Tom's going to have to do it because he lives there. So you have That's to true. find all the other people. Ah, right. okay. Yeah. Okay, we yeah, can but, do that. All right. Yeah. It was nice to meet you. Yeah, good to and meet you, too. And thank you, and good luck. That's and I'm fun. sorry you're not going to be here anymore. Oh, thank you. Yeah. With it's a new bike. adventure. Come visit. The bike community is going to miss you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You come there. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's a, yeah, field that's trip. Cool. We'll bring our cars. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> we find them u- useless, probably, right? Well, Actually, you'll find that the the um, infrastructure for cars is also really superb it's because good. it's separated, oh. and so it's very efficient. Wait, you can have both? You can. Cars and bikes? Yeah. Together? Separate. They're together, oh, but separate. They're separate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. In the yeah. same country. And so it but. makes it safer to drive a car because there's no bikes to, in- in- uh-huh. you know, interfere with. So, uh-huh. Uh-huh. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Have you ridden the downtown bike path? I did. did you did? Yes. And what did you think? Some parts are good. It's a start. I don't, I don't know if I like the little white poles necessarily. <laughs> they do make you feel a little safer from traffic. The one way is bizarre with the angle over the road. I, I'm not a fan, but I can see what they're trying to do. Um, and then the bubbles, the <laughs> little <trying>. bubbles. <laughs> the, the Why little... didn't they just separate it? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. You're talking about like on the corner of Fifth and Arlington, where there's yes. those little bubbles in the road. Yes, the bubbles. Are... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't quite understand that, uh-huh. uh, or I don't think they function really well. No. Um, when, uh, when I was riding it, actually, there was a guy that cut inside of the bubbles, so he went through the bike lane instead of taking the wide turn, like the Around. bubbles are supposed to uh-huh. get you to do he just cut to the right of the bubbles and went through the bike lane yeah. right after i had gone through the intersection so i don't think the people in reno have quite figured out what the bubbles mean yet yeah yes and the fact that we don't even know what to call them probably says something too <laughs> <laughs> oh, <not bubbles. laughs> I uh, bubbles. Yeah. um another p- another part of course well, we're gonna protect yeah. people with bubbles yeah. uh. another, another part i don't like is that um while their effort is you know plotable i guess um when the infrastructure ends on uh, what's that still North Virginia all of a sudden when you get to Midtown it's like oh you know bike Good lane work. ends and there's no infrastructure whatsoever and you're on a narrow road and yeah it's it, it when you do planning for bike routes it needs to be complete it can't just be a section and say a pat on the back oh we did this no it needs to be contiguous throughout the city um, so that you yeah you don't get pushed into car traffic all of a sudden at the end of it yeah. Yeah. I've been saying that that's like inviting people into a pit of alligators. Mm, yeah, <laughs> similar. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. Some people agree yeah. with that. I don't know. You know, yeah. some 4,000 pound alligators yes. with yeah. four wheels. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that go 100 miles an hour yeah. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, those. that's my feedback on that bike lane. I understand you're going to go bike it now? Yeah, I think so. I think we'll go ride it. And, and then and you have some good conversations. Yeah, we'll Definitely. we'll talk while we ride our bikes, That'll which I fun. think will be the first time for Bike Life Radio. Yeah. Okay. Like riding a bike and talking okay. at the same time. You got be, your with somebody there, else. Right? Be shaved. Yeah. Yeah, wear your helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring it. Oh, oh well. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for taking the time. Yeah, fun. Good. Okay, right. I'm going to go to my party. Okay, go we'll go to party. ours. We'll go to ours. Right. Hey, yeah. Jolene. This is Bike Life Radio from KWNK and the Reno Bike Project. All right, Tom, we're uh, we're on uh, First and Virginia Street in downtown Reno, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and we were talking about uh, the Netherlands and and your riding over there, and we're gonna ride down the bike path here in downtown Reno and and kind of talk a little bit about how this might be different than what you would experience over there. It's quite different, yeah. I rode a lot in, in Utrecht. Um, which is the busiest city that we rode in. You would very rarely have interaction unless you were in the city core with other vehicles, with other cars. And most of the other traffic, which they have bike traffic jams over there, um, were were bikes. Because even the pedestrians are separated from the bikes. <laughs> <laughs> so you were stuck in a bike traffic jam? I was, yeah. Cause How they, long? Oh, just one one light cycle. But Was, was you know, there an accident? No. It was just oh. there were so many bikes. Oh. And it was 
five o'clock in the afternoon when everybody was getting off work and biking home. Um, there were thousands of bikes on a bike path. You're listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK Studios. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. We're going to be back in a minute. Meet a victim of infrastructure injustice. That's right. My name's Kevin. Kevin wanted to ride his bike from UNR through downtown to Midtown. That's right. That's right. But there are no bike lanes through downtown Reno. Kevin tried to ride his bike anyway. He chose Center Street. Yeah, yeah, going the opposite way, yeah, because it's it's all downhill and you can go real fast. Without bike paths, streets are dangerous. He found out the hard way. Someone put an island right there where it don't belong. I hit that circle going head on, and I went like 40 feet. I could get out of bed for two weeks. It's time to stand up for the victims of infrastructure injustice like Kevin. People on bikes, scooters, and motorized wheelchairs deserve safe streets too. Go to buildabetterbikenetwork.com and end infrastructure injustice. Kevin will thank you. That's right. That's right. You're listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Back to our interview now. And, and so, did you have this like giant smile on your face, and oh, then people are looking, yeah. and then people were looking at you, and they're like, "Why are you smiling? Why are you smiling? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck in traffic. Like, damn it. Can you imagine this many people in cars in a city center? It would be gridlock. All right, the lights turned green, so we're going. We're passing some bike boxes. Oh, I guess what we were getting at is. Uh, what how is 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 this similar we're, we're separated somewhat from traffic here is is this similar to what you saw or is it totally different it's totally different um so we just came through an intersection where they crossed from two uh directional bike lanes to one shared bike path that has two directions on the bike path and this we, is what we, you would find mostly in the Netherlands, actually, where you have a cycle, what we call a cycle track, where you have both directions of traffic on one side. It's very common over there. What's uncommon, or what one of the big differences is, when you have intersecting streets, the bikes typically have the right of way, and the infrastructure is such that the the markings on the street or even the, the type of street that it is dictate who has the right of way. And it's a, it's a visual cue to the users that, hey, I'm in a residential area where I'm in a car, I'm a guest here, I need to slow down, and the bikes have the right of way. Um, whereas here, we have just on this one intersection, 15 different signs telling us what we're supposed to do because the infrastructure isn't there to tell us what to do. Like the paint on the road or the... Right, like right here, this is pretty confusing. If you look at it, uh, you know, do not enter except for bicycles. It's it's a little, you know, I get it. This is temporary infrastructure. They're they're trying out an experiment, but it's, it's not uh, the way it would be done uh, in other places. Yeah, it, like... It, it, the sign doesn't say one way for cars, do not enter for bicycles, uh, except for bicycles, do not enter for cars, yeah. uh, okay to walk over here, you yeah. know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> you yeah. have to read a sign before you could do anything. Right. And like whenever we have a, uh, a crossing of a road, well, uh, you would have a, a continuous sidewalk where the cars would basically come up a speed hump onto the sidewalk. Instead of here, the pedestrian is a guest in the street, where over there, the car is a guest in the pedestrian or the bike infrastructure. And it's it's very easy to know where you are in relation to other users of that infrastructure. You know, one of the things that I, I, I think is interesting is, uh, you know, talking to people in the United States or you know, and even in, in smaller towns or in states, and everybody seems to have their own kind of like, we have our, our way of doing it, or we gotta reinvent the wheel every time. Yeah. Is Do you find that, like that's my own perspective, do you find that too? I do, yeah. Let's take a right. Let's take a right. Okay. 
It'll be uh, safer. <laughs> While we're trying to interview and, and, and uh, ride bikes at the same time. That's, you th that's one, of the pieces. one of the things that uh, you did when you were over there in the Netherlands is you met with the Dutch Cycling Embassy, didn't you? I did, yeah. Who are they? So the Dutch Cycling Embassy uh, basically was set up by the Dutch government uh, to help get the word out about how to do cycling infrastructure the correct way. Uh, they had so many requests from other countries to show us how you do this that they finally said, okay, we'll just, we'll set up an organization that specifically does that. And so they go around the world and teach municipalities how to do safe, uh, integrated bike infrastructure. Wow. And so... Uh, you, you met with them and, and now you know who they are and, uh, and they're coming here to the United States, aren't they? Uh, that's right. They'll be on the West Coast in September and we're trying to get them to come here to Reno and give a presentation, a three-day presentation to the citizens and also the, the decision makers and the engineers, the city planners, anybody that's, that's participating in installing this type of infrastructure, um, I think would really benefit from having not just that uh, three-day presentation, but also making those contacts where if they have questions about how do we do, you know, we got a weird intersection here. How do we, how do we do this? They, they've made those connections. And that's, I think, as important as the actual presentations that they will do and they'll actually do a lot of research before they come out and have sort of a general idea of what a good plan would be uh, and then uh, they're not here to to tell you what to do but they want to help guide the municipality in making the right right decisions because it's a big investment for the city and if if those the dutch have already gone through 30 or 40 years of iterating this um, they figured out how to do it and so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here uh, we can take their knowledge and, and implement it and save a lot of money in the long run huh, save a lot of money oh yeah wouldn't that be nice yeah uh <laughs> how did that figure in here well you look at you know you put in this temporary infrastructure to, to try to figure out what works somebody's already figured out what works so they're gonna have to come back and and redo a lot of this to make it safe for the users yeah a uh, very very good point um, and I think that kind of brings us to the education element like we're not really like they it, uh, you know, we're here doing it and, you know, riding on it and we can see that it works. So they kind of know that it's going to work, but uh, will the public will, you know, like it's like, kind of like piloting the uh, to get people to know what this is. Right. right. And, and to make this work, it needs to be connected. Uh, you need to have a destination. It needs to be connected to other bikeways. Uh, their, their sort of design criteria for a, a good bike infrastructure is a minimum of four kilometers. Uh, what's, huh. and, Interesting. Um, if you don't have that, you know, I can ride down Fifth Street and get to Virginia Street. Okay, now what? Now I'm dumped out on Virginia and I'm, uh, as you say, swimming with the sharks. <laughs> you know, there's this public education element and I'm kind of wondering whether the Dutch embassy can help us with that because this is like the Wild West, you know? Everybody's used to riding their horse and shooting their guns <laughs> and, uh, and maybe the Dutch are like, whoa, you know, we've never had to really deal with that before. And uh, so we don't know how to help you uh, sell this to the public. I think, I think it's a big part of their program actually is, uh, the educational component, um, getting the word out, you know, f having people part of the the conversation for where do you want 
bike lanes? Where do you, where do you want um, the maybe a bike share program or, or something along those lines? Um, and just teaching, you know, getting the, the, the police involved in, in that conversation. Where's a high risk intersection? Where, where are there the most fatalities that we've had a lot, way too many of in Reno? Speaking of which, uh, I think that, and, and it's not like the Dutch haven't had some sort of experience with, uh, uh, you know, negative experience with, with kids dying in particular, right? Uh, like you, you learned a little bit of the history for them of uh, moving towards a car centric culture and then saying, whoa, right? Exactly. Yeah. In the 70s, uh, they were on the same path as a lot of other European cities that, you know, the car was becoming ubiquitous. And so they were ready to put in six lane highways and tear down historic areas and put big uh, four lane roads in there. And the the fatality rate of a lot of the children because they played in these roads skyrocketed. And so there was a big uproar from the population that said, this isn't what we want. Let's figure out a better way to do this. And there was a, a strong political motivation behind that that made it happen. They made it a priority. And over the years, it got better and better. So it didn't just happen overnight. These things take time. So it just takes that political will to push through the the people who <laughs> we we almost had an accident. <laughs> Sorry. So the the people, w when this first comes about, as we've seen just with this little bit of infrastructure, the car users are up in arms. How dare you take away a travel lane from my car? You know, you made me go one street over. How can that be? And there was a lot of that in the Netherlands too. But it takes that political. Uh, willpower to look at the the greater good I guess you could say of, of having safe right safe safe infrastructure for everybody because not everybody can afford a car yeah. um, so it's so a really really good point uh, you know about people complaining uh, you know who are in cars in the you know that we've, we've recently had to respond to hundreds and hundreds of complaints about one bike path through downtown and some of the drivers seem to think that all the streets in downtown Reno are suddenly going to disappear like they're like you know we took six feet down one street and uh and suddenly there's like it's the end of the world for the car yeah, yeah. and and like the a lack of attachment to reality right and you know actually the the opposite is true. When you get these people that would otherwise be in a car out of their car and on a bike, you reduce congestion, you reduce traffic, traffic flows better. It's uh, it's a win-win for all the users, not not just the cyclists. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a really good point. People in cars can have less traffic uh, that they have to deal with and fewer cars because there's more bikes on the road. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. Let's take a ride uh, right here again. I want to get a somebody to take a video of us riding uh, while we do an interview because this is a first for me. I've never done an interview on a, on a bike while we, we're riding. Yeah. yeah. So what do you what do you think of it? It's uh, it's great. Yeah. 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 I hope the uh, the wind doesn't wash everything out. But... Well, and we haven't crashed. Not yet. The, the night is young. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK Studios. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Today is our first show about international stuff related to bikes, uh, dedicated to that entirely. We just talked to Tom and Yana, and up next, my parents, Sandy and Mark Bovee. They rode their bikes around the world in the year 2000, so they started at the Parade of Roses, and then they just kept going. This was all part of a, an organized thing. Uh, they did write a book about it, Four Legs, Two Wheels. It's available on Amazon. Here they are, reading from that book. 
Introduction On January 1st of the year 2000, my husband and I embarked on an amazing adventure. Average cyclists with some limited experience in long-distance touring, we began a bicycle journey that would cover more than 16,000 miles and take us to over 40 foreign countries in 366 days. The tour was offered by a professional bicycling company and was the first ever attempt to guide 250 cyclists around the world, completing the entire itinerary of cycling in one year. The tour was called Odyssey 2000. My husband and I accomplished the journey on a tandem bicycle. This book is a compilation of personal journal entries created on the road. They reflect the joys, frustrations, and mental and physical stresses that were inherent in an adventure of this magnitude. 80 mile cycling days in heat, rain, and headwinds, camping in dust and bunking in bomb shelters, trying to find and use toilets in unfamiliar environments, it all became the stuff of real life for an entire year. Our fellow cyclists were our community and we came to know them with familial intimacy. From South Africa to Norway to China, our planet holds wonders beyond the typical tourist attractions. Whether cycling, the back roads of rural communities, climbing and crossing major mountain ranges, or navigating the streets of the most famous cities in the world, nothing can compare with experiencing the world from a bicycle seat. We hope you enjoy this adventure. Chapter 1, Preparation Often we have been asked, how did you prepare for a trip like Odyssey? Most people who ask this question are referring to training for the physical demands of long-distance daily cycling. To be sure, we had to do a lot of physical training, but equally important was the pre preparation to be away from home for a whole year. Who would care for our home in our absence? Who would pay our bills and monitor our mail? How can we ensure our health and medication needs will be covered on the road? And my personal dilemma, who will cut my hair? We began our preparation four years before the trip. We estimated that it would cost each of us $32,000, which we would pay over time. Whoa, you might say, that's a lot of money. Indeed, it is a lot of money. But we looked at it like this. Virtually all our living costs for the year of Odyssey would be covered by that amount of money, including food and lodging and flights, bus, train, and ferry transportation. We would have no gasoline, insurance, or vehicle maintenance costs, no groceries to buy, no electric or gas bills to pay. Since we would be on the road constantly, shopping trips for souvenirs or clothing would not be a frequent occurrence, and there wouldn't be any room to store those kinds of things anyway. Our physical and mental preparation included participation in a cycling trip that would give us a sense of what it would be like to be on a bike for weeks at a time. We were already familiar with seven-day trips like Cycle Oregon. So we signed up for a six-week trip across the United States following a southern route. Because this trip was organized by the same company that was planning Odyssey, we would be able to see how the staff operated during the long trips. 
You're listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK Studios. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. We're going to be back in a minute. Weenie, I am sorry. Your bark is so annoying. You're like that bike group that's always complaining about improving micromodal transportation. What? You agree with them? I guess a dog is micromodal. (laughs) Well, Weenie, if you feel so strongly about making our roads safer for bikes and dogs and kids, why don't you just go fill out the Safe Mobility for All survey at bikewashout.org? Wow, Winnie, I didn't realize you could type and use the internet. Can you go out and tell people about the Safe Mobility for All survey and show them how to fill it out at bikewashoe.org? Oh, oh, you want me to tell people? I hadn't really thought of that. I'll give it a try. Go to bikewashoe.org and fill out the Safe Mobility for All survey. Yeah, I got to work on it. Now, if we could just figure out how to tell people. What? Use the radio? What's that? Oh, 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 I think I heard of it. It has dials and antennas and static and stuff, right? Why would we use that? (laughs) You're listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK Studios. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Sandy and Mark Bovee rode around the world with a group. They had everything arranged. Uh, It was all arranged ahead of time. Uh, Places to stay and food. But that's a lot of work and uh, money. So now there's a registry of places to stay around the world for cyclists, and it's called warmshowers.org. They're the ones who run it. And they also have a podcast. It's also called Bike Life, but it's the Bike Life podcast. And they interview people who are traveling around to interesting places. Here's Taverly, the host of Bike Life podcast from warmshowers.org. How did this uh, come about? Did you start this organization? or I actually did not. I am the second executive director that this organization has had. And prior to that, one of the first executive directors is actually one of the founders, an individual that participated in coding and a lot of the grassroots efforts that happened with this organization. In fact, Warm Showers was for the first 10 years primarily driven by those that were touring that wanted to connect with hosts. And it started on an Excel spreadsheet with, you know, 10 and then 100 and then 1,000 names and connections. And it grew so big that the organization decided to become a formal nonprofit organization. And through the course of that time, of course, you know, we have had many upgrades and changes to our technology. And, And when I came in, It was time for us to really start to buckle down our systems and upgrade our technology because we are over 190,000 users right now, which is amazing. 190,000 users. What are these people doing, these 190,000 people? Well, we have touring cyclists that are on the road doing either a short-term or a long-term tour, and we have hosts that provide accommodations, support, kindness, sometimes just a friendly meal or a friendly face along the way. And some people do both. So you can join Warm Showers as a host or as a touring cyclist or as either that you desire at the moment. And that's warmshowers.org, right? That's correct. Yes. We, you know, we like to think that, you know, our organization is really meant to supplement a tourist's, like a cycle tour's journey, right? I mean, they might um, wild camp, they might Uh, They might hike, they might, you know, camp in campgrounds, they might work with hotel rooms or use hostels or Airbnbs, but we fill a role of providing a touring cyclist the opportunity to truly connect with the community, which is what I think is amazing about what we do is that you can go into a local community and if there's a host available, they really welcome you into the fold of, of, of who they are and where they're located, which you don't necessarily get if you are wild camping <laughs> or you know bike packing um, along the way. So that connection really seems to enhance a cyclist's journey. 
huh, that's amazing. And and it's like ten dollars or something, right? Like it's incredibly cheap. It's well, it's 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 a thirty dollar one time lifetime fee. Like that's it. It's it's an administrative fee that allows us to continue to support our technology, but you don't pay after that. Now, if you want to utilize the features of the app, there is a small monthly subscription, but the the website itself is available in your browser once you've paid this one-time fee, lifetime access. So there, there really is no fee and there, there is no money exchanged between a host and a cyclist. That is a reciprocal hospitality, which is really the vision and passion behind who we are. Huh, amazing. And, and so then you're like talking to people uh, throughout the world who are on their bikes and, and in these experiences with a hundred some thousand people out there. How do you pick who you're going to talk to? You mean for our podcast specifically? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we have an application process and we sometimes have a quite a large waiting list and sometimes we make our way through the wait list. But we, you know, we really select variety. We try to select variety because really the core of our podcast is about storytelling. And that became super important during the pandemic when people weren't traveling or experiencing this passion that they all have. You know, we really realized that we filled a role to keep people connected by sharing their stories. So we look for variety and, and, and different types of stories. Although the, the premise is the same, right? We're sharing stories of bike touring and hosting, but everybody has a different facet to their experience, not even just with warm showers, but their experience in a different part of the world. So we just look for variety and, and we try to make our way through the whole list. I, I like to think that anybody that uh, has a story to tell, we want to make space for them if possible. Before uh, warm showers existed and people were, uh, you know, making these, these connections you know, with, with people who are, you know, offering free services at home, what is it that bike tourists were doing with it is kind of uh, and and have you facilitated that uh, uh you know more people participating yes we have, we have definitely facilitated more people participating and i think now more than ever we desire to have freedom to explore and a bicycle is a really beautiful way to do that it's a different pace it's a different connection to nature it is a different way to experience a part of the world and and as more people desire to have that experience you know of course our user base continues to grow and we do that primarily through word of mouth through our partner organizations you know we don't we don't really do any type of uh, formal advertising and I'll say yet because we truly desire to increase our our host capacity in certain parts of the world. So we will probably put some advertising in to ensure that our cyclists have hosts in places that they desire to visit. Um, but prior to that, I would imagine from what I've heard is a lot of times someone that's on a long bike tour, you know, their bike is laden down with bags or they're, they're pulling additional supplies and oftentimes they get stopped in communities and offered a home or they will meet someone through another hosting service or in a campground and doors just just open right doors just open when you're in this community i mean a person on a, a bicycle that's traveling for a hundred days is unlikely you know uh, going to appear the same as someone who's just cycling to work so it creates a lot of community engagement so i imagine that people either found communities, backpacked, or found alternate locations. Uh, speaking of stories, do you have a, uh, a favorite one that you've heard over the years? Uh, you know, somebody in some strange place doing something very strange? I, I have heard so many good stories. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have a favorite. I will say that I'm still surprised regularly. I recently spoke to a woman who is the first woman to do a long tour, bike tour from India, and she did it solo. And so for her, in, in her culture, it's it's considered very different, right? So like that 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 is just recent of mind and super interesting to me that an individual would embrace on something that's so different than what they know, right? Imagine the transformation that she not only provides for herself, but shows others what's possible. So that's really interesting. I've also really enjoyed interviewing individuals that are either super young on their journey and they embark on a, a life transforming experience or even those that are in their retired years. I mean, we interviewed a woman who is uh, 75 to 80 range and she's toured by herself for months at a time. 
So these stories of these incredible feats of what our body can do and going at our own pace and not looking at it like a destination, but a journey, no matter whose story it is, there's always something that I love about it. Excellent. And uh, so we're talking to the Taverly England of A Warm Showers, who does a uh, bike life podcast. Um, the, the podcast element of this uh, and telling the stories is important. Why? Why is that important? I think it makes our world smaller. It makes our world smaller. It creates less division. It brings us together as you know, one human race over this shared passion of bike touring and connecting with people from around the world. I also think that there's not a lot of platforms where you know, non-professional podcasters can really come on and talk about transformation and community and breaking down barriers to division. I think that that's, that's rare. And we, of course, want to utilize our platform to provide as much of that as possible because we know that once you connect someone else to even the idea of what it's like to tour in the Middle East or tour in South America, maybe you didn't even know what that would be like. And through the sharing of someone's story, you can experience what's possible. And then your mind allows that to be a possibility for you too. Same with hosting. Excellent. Again, we're talking to Taverly England of uh, warmshowers.org that does the Bike Life uh, podcast. And you're listening to KWNK Bike Life Radio. And uh, so do you have any examples of, I know that this is probably a pretty tough question, of how people on bikes have changed the world, in your opinion? You've got this kind of, this broad perspective of, of cyclists throughout the entire world uh, you know, uh, sharing space and, and time and information. Do you have any examples of how bicyclists have, have changed the world either recently or not too yeah, far Yeah, I have, I have, I have three that come to mind. Of course, what we've been speaking about, number one, the most important thing that they do is, is they make the world smaller, right? They, ex, you know, they expose and connect with other people around the world. And that right there is, you know, as we know, mind and heart opening to connect with another human that is not the same as you. So that's number one. Number two, we have a lot of cyclists that work on sustainability projects for the planet because, of course, riding a bicycle does not create any emissions. It's not harmful to the environment. And so a lot of cyclists become really passionate about the environment. And there have been many, many, many causes embraced and supported along people's cyclist journeys. And then the third way that I often see is a lot of cyclists will dedicate their journey to a specific nonprofit organization. So maybe they're cycling to support uh, a cause that's close to their heart or their family or their community. We've, we've even experienced a, a cyclist that was cycling to teach people along the journey about addiction recovery. And he, he actually himself is a recovering addict, and he speaks to every single person he comes across along his journey about his experience. And of course, that just brings throes of people his way to have conversations. And he's not the only one. There are several people that really just embrace something of service for them, and they build it into their tour. And there are many fundraisers that happen through bike journeys. There are many nonprofit organizations that organize bike tours. There is definitely a lot of uh, community service built into it. So those are the three most common ways that I've seen impact. But I'm sure there's many more that just didn't come to the forefront of my mind. <laughs> All right. So you connect people who are out in the world on bicycles, uh, traveling the world uh, with with potential hosts. Um, and then you interview those people about uh, their experience uh, and their experiences. Um, and so you spend a lot of time doing that, talking to other people about their experiences. But do you have a, 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 a personal story uh, of you and a bike or, or anything? Oh, that's a great mentioned? question. Yeah. Thank you for asking me that question. <laughs> I would, I would say one of my favorite experiences on my bike is when my father, who rides a recumbent bike because he's had so many you know, joints replaced, uh, he finally built himself up for us to be able to do like a full day ride. I mean, morning to night together. And it was, it was really quite amazing because for him, that's, that's difficult. It was difficult for him to train up to be able to do it. But for me to be able to bring my own passion for cycling and have my father next to me on his very cool recumbent bike, which is, is very functional. And, and he, he is, it's amazing to see what he's been able to accomplish. And so, yeah, that, that is my own personal favorite is to be able to do it with somebody I love. 
how has this podcast and warm showers changed your life, would you say? Mm, that's also a very good question. And I appreciate you bringing my own experience into it. I, I have definitely been very changed by warm showers. I have a background in nonprofit management, so I've been working with nonprofit organizations for almost 18 years. And when I started with warm showers, it was really the international community aspect to it that attracted me to this organization that has, you know, two, you know we're, we're two part-time staff and primarily volunteer-driven. It shows me heart and passion, and I have experienced that every single day as well as a lot of people that are, you know, a little bit oftentimes unhappy that we don't have something that or a feature they want on our website or, you know, our our, our newsletter is not translated into the right language that they desire. I think of it like those are just roadmaps to provide better service for people to be able to connect. So I've, I've definitely learned a lot around how hearts can lead our way in this community and being open to new experiences. And that impacts me. It carries over into everything that I do in my own life because I get to see people from around the world being open and kind and removing division. It's, it's quite spectacular. Wonderful. Taverly England of Bike Life Podcast and warmshowers.org, which um, helps people out in the world on bikes connect with uh, hosts. And uh, it's very cheap and... Uh, um, and, and, and an amazing uh, uh, program. So thank you for doing it. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me and supporting Warm Showers. We, we appreciate all of the opportunities to be involved. And, you know, thank you for your time. That's Taverly of warmshowers.org and the Bike Life Podcast. Check it out. That's it for Bike Life Radio, where we get on our bikes and we record people uh, out on their bikes out in the world. Bike Life Radio is made possible by BikeWashoe.org and K Wink Studios in Reno, Nevada, owned and operated by the nonprofit bike shop Reno Bike Project. If riding around the world or even to the grocery store seems unachievable, remember what this community professor Scott Stoll once said. A bicycle ride around the world begins with a single pedal stroke. So start pedal stroking to the store and maybe you'll just never stop. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on.